thank you all for coming today. It just shows how far Joe's reach was. was. We have friends here from Australia and Georgia and Texas and Florida, Virginia, England, and even Ireland, just to name a few places. I want to thank my brothers and sisters, my nieces and nephews, and my dear Robert for always being so supportive. I'm so grateful for my museum family, Kay, Angie, Lynn, Jay, Tyler, Justin, Ethan, Laurie, Mike, Billy, Vic, Wilson, John Michael, JW, Morgan, Jackson, Ian, and Terrence for all your love and keeping the museum running seamlessly, even though I know you're grieving also. I want to introduce our children, our youngest, Bradley, our son, Blake, and his wife, Emily, our daughter, Britt, her husband, Alex, and our precious grandsons, Sterling <laughs> and Finn. <laughs> Joe taught our children by example. He had a heart of gold and was loving, kind, and selfless. He was always thinking about others. His biggest joy in life was to be able to make someone else happy. Yeah. Joe was funny. He could light up a room with a sense of humor and positive attitude. We were married for 42 years, and he made me laugh every day, even when he was driving me crazy. <laughs> Joe was the most optimistic person I've ever known. No matter how bad any situation was, he could turn it around and find a hidden blessing. Several times while he was in the ICU, he would tell us what a great day he was having and how wonderful the Vanderbilt doctors and nurses were. After several weeks in the hospital, Joe became very close to the Vanderbilt staff. It's so nice to see so many of the nurses and doctors here to honor Joe today. During the last week of his life, every day one of the doctors would come in to tell him there was nothing else they could do for him. Joe would make a joke and try and make them feel better. He said to me, can you imagine how hard it must be for them to have to give me such bad news? One of the last things that Joe told me was that he felt that he had lived such a blessed life and for us to please not grieve. I find great comfort in knowing that he knew that he was loved and was at peace. Even though my heart is broken, I feel blessed to know that Joe will live on through our children, through his songs, and through a museum that will go in, on in perpetuity. But most of all, I feel blessed that all of you are here today to celebrate Joe and to help bring comfort to our family. We are all fortunate to have loved and to have been loved by Joe. Hey, I'm Brad. Ooh. And uh, I'm Joe's, Joe's youngest son, and uh, Joe Fash. I'm just going to wing it. So uh, I want to talk about the guitar, a story I got from the guitar store. So um, we pretty much grew up in that guitar store. And uh, it was much more than just a guitar store because uh, dad was solving uh, marriage, marriage problems, financial issues. Like these guys <laughs> would just come in and ask dad for advice, and he always uh, gave it the best he could. So. One thing he did, though, is uh, when he'd pick up a guitar, he just strum it a couple of times and, and give it back to the customer. And, and uh, one day we were leaving the uh, West End store, and I was probably fourth or fifth grade, and I asked him, I said, you know, why don't you pick it up and rip it, you know? And uh, he's like, because it's not about me. It's about the guitar and the guy standing in front of me. And um, that's pretty much how I feel he lived his life, like the museum and everything else. And uh, so, like, in my life, especially at the end, he would call me at, like, clockwork every every night and be like, uh, he'd say, he'd draw my name out and be like, now, Brad, where are my photos? Not the nudies, you know, but he wanted to see <laughs> my remodels. And uh, anyways, he was always more interested in what I had going on than... Uh, you know, what, what he had. And he had so much more than 
well, pretty much most people you know. So he's just uh, always interested in somebody else. So I just want to, the last uh, thing he said to me was, uh, don't, all, don't um, ever forget to give more than you get, so. Am I going? Hey, um, I'm the same <laughs> as Bradley and Dad, too. I have so much that I could say, and it's really hard for me to not be long-winded. Um, I think we get that honestly. So... Um, just thinking back on dad, um, he always involved us in everything. Um, for me, uh, I was told as an infant, I was just taken in the car seat into songwriting sessions and the same with guitar shows. He always involved one of us, uh, to go to that. And then the same when the museum was being thought about, he had us involved in everything and, um, wanted us to go when he was doing interviews or, um, just even putting exhibits together. So uh, we always felt very special, very loved, and he always wanted to spend a lot of time with us. Uh, growing up, I think in fourth grade is when I realized dad was a cool dad. Um, we <laughs> had a field trip the whole fourth grade, and he just entertained everybody and gave everybody a pick. And uh, from that time on, I always thought, all my friends really want to be my friend to be friends with that. Um, <laughs> so I just remember a lot of times in high school, good memories of people calling me like, hey, what are you doing? Yeah, you, you want to come over? Sure. Well, is your dad going to be there? And I'd be like, yeah. And then they would all just sit around dad and just <laughs> laughing. <laughs> and uh, I always thought it was because he was involved in the music industry and then when we went to the ICU um, often, well, every night my brothers would stay the night, and then me and my mom would stay at a hotel. And I would leave, and I would look back after all the I love you, okay, see you tomorrow. And I found it so interesting because uh, nurses and doctors that were no longer his nurse or doctor were in there hanging out, laughing, usually eating muscadines or some kind of food that he wanted them to have. And I realized, like, it wasn't the music industry, even outside of his wheelhouse. He just like calmly and humbly controlled a room. Um, and I found that so amazing, but that's again, just who he was. Um, in the end, there were like, I have all these quotes like at the end, but he just kept coming back and he had so much to say. They're like, this is your last day. He's like, no, I'll probably hear a week. Um, but it never stopped and it was truly amazing. I know we're really, really blessed to, uh, have all of that time with him because I always felt so close to my dad and, uh, there wasn't a day that for, for me and I think for a lot of people, he made so much out of just a moment. He always wanted to surprise people, do the biggest thing for a person, even in a moment. That's why there's been so many people to reach out. Um, and so if I had a moment with my dad, then I would have been blessed. So for, for as long as we did, and then especially those last three weeks were amazing. Um, every time we walked in once he would want everybody to know this 50 pounds of fluid were taken off of him. He was always already happy about the 40 pounds he had lost. Um, he was at his goal weight. <laughs> he was very concerned about getting new jeans if he got to go home. Um, but of course he felt so good and he looked so good. Everybody complimented his hair, his complexion. Um, finally he's like, can I get a mirror? Um, and then he was really pleased with what he saw. And, um, yeah, he just felt so good. And that it, so it felt like going into this fountain of youth, like when we went in, cause he was so energized and just so happy and planning real estate with Bradley, new plans. He had us. Uh, working on the award show November 22nd, please come. And um, he just, he never stopped. So one story my mom told me, and I'll try to finish here. Um, when he was uh, writing uh, and thinking that was gonna be his career, he was up against the dance and he was a younger songwriter. And so 
he was like, oh, you know, this could be really, really good for my career, and this is what I can do from here on out. And he lost to the dance. And uh, instead of being upset or anything, he just said, yeah, that's who, who, that's what should win. That's the song that's going to live on with people forever. And uh, so one of the last things he said, you know, he said, I have no regrets. I I'm not in pain. I'm so happy. He was ex so excited to go to Jesus. It, it was incredible. And he said, it's, it's just like the dance. Um, I could have missed the pain but I would have also had to miss the dance. And so that's how we always felt about him, and that's how he felt about life. So this is the celebration, that he lived that life and, you know, was uh, just happy to be alive. That's it. Well, I'm completely opposite to Bradley and Britt. I've got this whole thing written out. <clears throat> but I'll try not to just read it. So my name's Alex. I'm the son-in-law of, of Joe, married to Britt. Um, so I first met Joe 13 years ago when I was visiting Nashville for the first time in 2009. Um, I was here to see Britt, and as a 24-year-old Aussie kid with not much to my name, I was a little bit intimidated, but I, did, I really didn't need to be. Joe always welcomed everybody he met, and I didn't realize at the time how much of a father figure he would come to be for me. Since his passing, I've been thinking about what he left me with. And what comes to mind constantly is just the fact that he was a kind, encouraging, and generous man. All you have to do is read the comments on the Facebook page or the YouTube channel, and you'll find countless stories of individual acts of kindness that Joe did when no one was looking, but that touched a lot of people. And I bet that everybody here has their own story. Joe told me a number of times that when someone came into one of his guitar stores, it was never his goal just to make a profit. He loved music and he wanted it to be a fun experience for anybody learning how to play. He would always say, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And he truly lived by that and carried that spirit into his business relationships and friendships. I was a recipient of his encourage, encouragement and support when I moved here with nothing to my name. I'll always be grateful for the bet that he took on me by letting me marry Brit. And the last words I ever said to him were, I'll miss you and I'll take care of Britt and the kids. And he said, I know you will. A lot of people may not realize, but before the museum opened its doors at the original location, Joe traveled the country interviewing musicians and songwriters in their living rooms, home studios, cafes, and even on the street. He literally carried a camera around everywhere he went. The footage can be seen behind us in the TVs in the museum today. So three years ago, just before the COVID pandemic, Joe decided to start a TV show called The Musician's Hall of Fame Backstage, and he paid to have it put on the local Channel 5 TV station. Um, after that, we started putting the shows on YouTube, and they, they really took off more than the TV station. So as well as the new interviews, we used all the old footage that he, that he got uh, previously and started the Musician's Hall of Fame Vault series. And he interviewed so many songwriters and musicians and has preserved so much music history that otherwise might have been lost. Joe would always say that the YouTube channel kept him going through the COVID pandemic. He couldn't believe how much people loved the interviews and, and he was always grateful for the people who would come and visit the museum and want a selfie or want to say hello because of, because of YouTube. And he never wanted the attention to be on him but on the musicians and the museum. Joe and I would work together on the phone to post videos with catchy titles and thumbnails and often we'd keep talking well after the video was posted. Joe would call me so often that Britt would hear my phone ring and just say, it's your boyfriend again. <laughs> We talk about family, we talk about life, we talk about our kids, and we grew very close, particularly in the last three years. Joe would often credit me with YouTube success, to which I would remind him that he's the one that collected all the amazing stories and content from around the country. It would have been nothing without what he did. So I'm grateful that Joe will live on through, through the internet with the interviews that he's recorded. Personally, I've only known Nashville, Tennessee with Joe Chambers in it. And for me, Joe Chambers is as Nashville as Nashville itself. When riding around town in the car with Joe, he would always have the music up loud, even if you were trying to have a deep conversation. <laughs> and he'd point out music history, like things like, that's where Roy Orbison saw a pretty woman walking down the street, or that's where Dust in the Wind by Kansas was recorded, or that's the studio where George Jones recorded one of my songs. All referring to a song we were listening to right then and there, he'd say, you hear those drums or that bass guitar? It's in the museum. <laughs> I love this quote by Joe's longtime friend, Kix Brooks. It's from an interview that was recorded 
right here on this stage three years ago. Kick said, I remember when you started putting this thing together, you took a huge leap of faith to put a spotlight on musicians. You developed the whole museum, you put it all together, and then with the growth of Nashville, were forced to move, and I can't imagine anybody but you having the passion to go to the effort to put this thing together. I'm just so proud of you for sticking with it and making it happen. There's a reason there wasn't a Musicians Hall of Fame before, because no one else could have pulled this off. I'll close with this. For the last two summers, Joe would pick up our oldest son, Sterling, from school in the summer to go and get a snow cone. And when Joe passed away, I told Sterling, who was four years old, that Joe had gone to heaven to be with Jesus. Sterling paused, looked at me and said, Daddy, I have an idea. Let's build an elevator to bring him back down. <laughs> if only we could, Sterling. So it's not often that somebody comes along that makes a kind of impact to the world like Joe Chambers did. His legacy will last generations. I'm grateful for Joe and I'm celebrating his life today. His family, friendships, this museum and the people in this room are a testament to a life well lived. Thank you. Please welcome Marcia Ware and Cliff Downs. Goodness. 
Dear Lord and giver of every good and perfect gift, thank you for giving each of us, each other, to learn what it means to love. Thank you for coming into our world to know and share our joys and our pains. Thank you for encouraging us that you have overcome the darkness. Amen. Well, music, like all good art, connects us and enriches us all at a level deeper than any of us can fully understand. Each of us is here today because Joe Chambers connected with us and enriched each one of us. His greatness as an artist grew from his essence as a truly good person. Along the way, even as he achieved so much, he never lost sight that it's the relationships that make life worthwhile. Joe related brilliantly with others because he was incredibly genuine. He trusted others, and he trusted God, and he trusted providence when his life took paths different than what he'd planned. From playing guitar to writing songs to owning guitar stores to starting this museum. When life rewarded him with success, he was grateful and humble. And when results were different than what he'd aimed for, he wasn't jealous of others. He trusted everything would work out. He acknowledged Garth Brooks' truth from the dance that while pain is sometimes woven into the fabric of life, it's still very much a life worth celebrating. Because he was authentic, he was able to focus on others in the moment. He made each one of us feel special and welcome. Joe chose to look for the best in life and in others. He wanted to, like Santa and and Disney and Andy Griffith, create a peaceful world with Childlike wonder and joy. The poet Elizabeth Barrett Browning writes, Earth is crammed with heaven, and every common bush a fire with God. But only he who sees takes off his shoes. The rest sit round and pluck blackberries. Well, in this world crammed with heaven, Joe not only took off his shoes, he danced. His presence infused life in us around him, I remember him taking joy in giving just the perfect Christmas gift, just as I recall him having me at the age of five stand on the console in his Mustang with my head through the sunroof as he cruised through the roads of Columbus, Georgia. Now, mind you, this was before seatbelt laws, so it was totally safe. But it's certainly a thrill for both of us. And years later, he was also the same caring man who counseled me how to drive safely in the rain and where to put my hands on the steering wheel. Joe had many impressive talents, but perhaps he shined brightest when lifting others up. His museum honors many who often didn't get enough recognition. His wildly popular YouTube videos interviewing musical legends, he asks about their lives out of respect and admiration, not to be witty or to shine the light on himself. Behind the scenes, Joe equally enjoyed spending time with the museum staff. He was darn lucky, and he knew it, that Kay Smith decided to come out of retirement to manage his legal documents for the last 17 years. Joe knew he could always rely on Mike Harden to maintain the museum as it it has grown into what it is today. For the last eight years, he was able to count on Tyler Rudesheim to faithfully transcribe his dictations to give form to his vision for a book on the museum, and take time to read through his ridiculously long texts about where to eat in his hometown. Knowing Joe, I'm sure he delighted in making them and the rest of the staff feel special, making them laugh, and knowing they were special to his heart. As Joe was widely known and loved in Nashville, I hope it won't be considered heresy for me to claim that perhaps not all country music lyrics are true equally. For example, George Jones saying he stopped loving her today when his subject passed away. But I believe that Joe's love for Linda and Blake and Bradley, like his soul, they live on. A love that is stronger than death itself, grounded in the goodness and the greatness of God. Likewise, Kenny Rogers Gambler once said, the best you can hope for is to die in your sleep, but Joe's vision was deeper and truer and more courageous than that in the end. Joe faced death the same way he faced life, full of gratitude, always thinking about others. In the midst of his illness, he talked more about his concern for the ICU staff at Vanderbilt than about himself. 
Joe took the time in the last hours on earth to call me, and I'm sure countless others, to reassure us he wasn't suffering. First John tells us that perfect love casts out all fear, and Joe's trust in God certainly reflects that. I'd like to end by sharing my personal favorite song of Joe's, one that never made it to a record, but a message that is true to his core, and I think what's best about life. The song is called Walt Disney Movie, and in it, the singer wished everyone could love someone as much as he cared for his beloved. In it, he wished his 1991 Atlanta Braves could have won, won the uh, World Series title. <clears throat> and as the song draws to a close, he wished that like a Walt Disney movie, love could be full of joy and peace right to the end. So as I reflect on Joe's life, he found the great love of his life in Linda and his children. I note today that the Braves are the current world champs. And right to the end of Joe Chambers' life, he was surrounded by those who gave him love and joy, and he faced the transition to the next verse of his being with peace. I think Joe got his wish. God bless you, Joe, and thank you. I just figured out when I grow up, I want to be like Joe Chambers. I wrote uh, some bullet points, and Cliff, Cliff and I were talking earlier. When you've known Joe Chambers as long as we have, and one of my best, best friends in the world, you really don't even, I could go for hours talking about Joe Chambers. What am I doing with, with the notes? But <clears throat> I did write down a couple little things. But, uh, you know, imagine like about 8 o'clock at night, maybe it's a Thursday, 8 o'clock, you got a movie queued up got some popcorn, your chairs lean back, your cell phone rings. I look down and it says Joe Chambers. And I uh, get up and go to the bedroom and Joe goes, hey man, what are you doing? <laughs> or he may say, hey sweetie. <laughs> or he may say something else that I'm not going to say right now, but, but, uh, all that is the good stuff, isn't it? That's, that's this life, man. That's the good stuff. And, uh, you know, I don't think he ever called me that he did not talk about my son, Ryan. He asked about Ryan. Ryan was, he hired Ryan when I think Ryan was 19 or 20, and he hired him to be a store manager, one of his guitar stores, the one in Cool Springs. And I don't think he ever failed to say, how's my other son, Ryan? I always said that, you know. And I, I don't think I've met uh, such a selfless person in my whole life. And, uh, you know, what I love, too, about Joe was he's the same all the time. I've been around him when he was with him, when he was around some so-called big shots, and he, act, he was Joe. And then I've been with him when a random tour might come through here, and I just happened to be with him, and he was the same then. He was just the same Joe always. And, uh, kindness that is unparalleled, you know, a uh, uh, quick quick story on this real fast. But Joe, uh, my son Ross, our youngest son, when he was about 11, 12, he loved ACDC and uh, an illustration of Joe's kindness. Uh, he loved ACDC. We bought tickets for him to go see with our daughter Holly and her husband, take him to see ACDC at Bridgetown. <laughs> and uh, he was so excited, about 11, 12 years old. And so the day before, Holly and Kevin had to uh, uh, unexpectedly go out of town, and he didn't have anyone to go with him. So I said, Ross, I'll take you down there. We got tickets. Let's go. I'll go with you. So I told Joe about that. And, you know, two days later, I think it was two or three days later, Joe shows up at my house way out in Williamson County with an ACDC signed guitar for Ross, who he had never even met. He didn't even know Ross. And it was a little must Fender Mustang handed it to Ross and said, here, buddy. And um, Ryan's, uh, when Ryan was managing the store, it did have some perks for me, the old man, because uh, Ryan would call. One day, Ryan called, and he said, Dad, there's, Joe brought in a really nice mid-60s uh, D30, Martin D35. It's a, it's a pretty nice one. You might want to come and look at it. So I, like, ran to my car and... and uh, 
got over there and it was it was really a not beautiful guitar and like i needed more guitars but but i called joe and i said joe uh, what's uh what do you want for that guitar i said that thing is i might have to take that off your hands and and you know it's probably worth i don't know Vinny could tell us i don't know but would be worth in those days be several thousand dollars probably you know and and so Joe goes, oh, I'll take seventeen hundred for it. And I go, Joe, I am not giving you seventeen hundred dollars for that guitar. I'm not going to do it. And he, and he goes, well, that's what I'm taking. I don't want any more. And I was just thinking, I laughed my butt off, going like, that's the first time I've ever argued with somebody the other way. You know, we argue for ten minutes. No, I'm going to give you. Know. <laughs> and this passion, you know, I uh, I remember coming into the store. One day at Cool Springs, and he was—he had the riser and the and the—it's in the museum here, but it was the riser and the staging that came out of uh, one of the clubs in Printer's Alley. It's where Jimi Hendrix performed that very stage, and Joe was showing it to me, and he said, "I want to talk to you about something." And he pulled me off. We went way in the corner of the store by ourselves, and he goes, "I'm thinking about starting this museum." the Musicians Hall of Fame, he goes, what do, you, what do you, I want to get your opinion, your thoughts on that. And he was looking me right in the eye and was really wanting to hear what I had to say. And I said, Joe, we all know Hal Blaine and we all know all these wonderful players. We love these guys. They're the best, you know, but I'm not sure the whole world, the average person don't know, you know, who Bob Moore is or these guys. I mean, certainly we all do players. We love these guys. They're iconic, all of them, Buddy Harmons and so forth. And Joe goes, well, that's the point. I want him to know them. That's that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to start this museum. And I love that that he always wanted to, he was the champion for the players, the musicians, the people that were in the shadows that really didn't, that, that, not that they really wanted it, but they were the guys behind the scenes, the ones that made the music. And and he just had this passion for that. There's, I've never seen anything like it. And he said, well, that's the point. I want everybody to know these guys. And he goes, I'm going to do it. And so he did, and here we are today. And, uh, I, you know, and he was so positive. He, he uh, after the flood and, you know, the tumultuous beginnings of the Hall of Fame, which is famous, everybody knows those stories. But And then the flood of 2010 came along. And I remember with Joe, we were holding Joe Osborne's bass. And the flood, you can see where the flood decimated this bass, beautiful old jazz bass. And, and uh, I was just heartbroken. I go, oh, man, this flood ruined it. And Joe goes, no, not really, because, no, first of all, no one's going to play it. From, you know, and he said, and now it's got another story. It's got even a more of a story. It's worth even more now because this was the base that, the base that survived the flood of 2010. I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> I mean, that's so great. That's so positive. So, you know, it, in this crazy world, and I won't ramble on, Further, but in this crazy world, you know, uh, I can guarantee you that it was this world was certainly made better and more wonderful because Joe Chambers was in it and in our lives.
Steve, your uh, guitar teacher was a lot better than mine was. <laughs> oh, I will definitely tell you that. So everyone in this room at some point has probably been asked, who's your best friend? And sometimes a lot of people will flow through your mind because we meet people early in our lives, we meet people later. But every time someone has asked me that question, since I've known Joe. I met Joe 44 years ago. Um, we were two struggling songwriters here in Nashville. Every time someone would ask me that question, Joe's picture would pop in my mind, into my mind first. And it was that way from pretty much a few months after I met him until a couple of weeks ago. And Joe's one of those guys that people think of best friends are those the people that you call when things aren't going well or whatever. With Joe, it was, it was not only that, but it was when things were going good or something cool happened, he would call you and say, man, I heard about this, I heard about that, and it was so great. And I always thought, that's really cool for somebody to do that because you know you did, he didn't have to do that. Um, when I met Joe, I think it was, I'm not even gonna say the year, because uh, a lot of you might not have been, bo been born. Um, I was playing in a club on Murfreesboro Road. It was a restaurant slash bar. All of a sudden, these uh, suspicious looking guys start coming in for dinner and they're sitting over their table and they're watching. And uh, after three or four nights, they walked over and said, hey, we're getting ready to open the Opryland Hotel. Uh, we have the house band. Would you like to join the band? And I'm looking around at you know steak and potatoes and I'm going, yeah, let's do that. So I joined the band only to be replaced by a salad bar like two weeks later. <laughs> and Joe never let me forget that. <laughs> oh yeah, he's the guy that got replaced by the salad bar. Um, so our band started playing all over, you know, we played Morgantown, West Virginia. We played probably every club in Nashville, after hours clubs. And then during the daytime, we were wandering around Music Row trying to figure out what the heck was going on. And uh, we started writing songs together. Joe's the first guy I ever wrote a song with, and I think same for him. And um, it wasn't too many months after hanging around Music Row, I'd say, Joe, well, you want to go, you know, you want to go do this? And he'd go, no, I'm, I'm meeting Billy for lunch. And I said, I said, Billy who? And he goes, Billy Sherrill. I was like, at that time, Billy was, you know, the biggest producer in the world and everybody loved him and admired him. And I'm thinking, you've been here for two months and you're having, <laughs> you're having less than Billy Sherrill. And then it becomes Harlan Howard and it becomes all these people I'm like going. And all of a sudden this phrase popped into my head. It's like, and all of you have probably said this phrase, that's Joe. That's the way Joe was. If he met Paul McCartney at the airport, he'd be at his house the next night having dinner with him. Uh, I learned to love and admire Joe. Um, I mean, we went through so many 
just incredibly funny stories together. Um, and it seems like every time we would talk about these 44 years, we would always sort of focus on the same three or four or five stories over and over and over because they stuck with us. And, uh, you know, Joe, when Joe decided to start this museum, I'm probably repeating some of what Steve said, but he called me and told me about it and asked me what I thought. I was like, I don't know, Joe. <laughs> Same thing. You know, a lot of people, we care about these guys, but a lot of people, they just want to hear, see the person on TV sing that. They don't care who played on it. But, uh, you know, Joe proved us all wrong, as he did many, many times when the first museum opened and we spent afternoons and nights down there getting it ready and cleaning and putting up displays. And then not long after, we all know, the museum had to be moved. And we put all the stuff in storage out at Soundcheck. And I remember holding this incredibly iconic acoustic guitar. I won't tell you whose it was, because you might be here. <laughs> and uh, somebody took a picture. We put it in the thing. Two weeks later, the flood hits. And we're, you know, I'm talking to Joe on the phone, and we're like going, oh, because we couldn't get to it. You couldn't even go out there and see it. So uh, finally, Joe called me and said, okay, we can go in today. Would you come with me? And I said, sure, let's go out there. So I met him out at Soundcheck, and we walked through the parking lot in uh, boots, galoshes, and uh, walked up on the ramp, and the first thing I saw was a sign that says, beware of snakes. <laughs> and I looked at Joe, I said, I ain't going out. <laughs> anyway, wound up going in, and... Uh, we went back to the locker, and it was obviously, you could see where the floodwaters had risen above everything. And um, I saw that iconic acoustic guitar case. And I looked up and I thought, I don't know if I want to open this. So I turned around and opened it, turned it upside down, and water just started pouring out of it. And I looked at Joe and I said, I said what are you going to do? And it's just like Steve said. He says, we'll go get it out. It's all going to be fine. So it's all, it's all, we're going to get them all fixed, which I was thinking, you got a, you know, a couple hundred instruments in here. How's that going to happen? Well, Joe being ever the optimist, he figured it out. And then when he found, found out that he was going to put it down here, um, people finally started to realize what he was doing. And Joe has, a lot of people don't understand how hard it was for Joe to find some of these, these instruments and these memorabilia pieces that are in this museum. I mean, he would travel and meet with somebody's aunt, which went to their grandmother, which went to, just to find one item. And he did a lot of this by himself. And, but he was, he was, Joe was a dreamer. He was determined. Um, he, was, he was bigger than life. And uh, I had learned to love and respect him so much, just watching how he handled himself. And as we all know, Joe was, Joe could say some funny things, some of which we wouldn't, uh, <laughs> we wouldn't repeat here. I used to get those calls too at night, except I got him at 11 o'clock or midnight. You got him at eight. <laughs> um, a lot of people in this room and in this town would not be in this business were it not for the people represented back here in this room behind me because this, the soundtrack of all of our lives is back there, a lot of it. And um, Joe realized that before any of us did. And um, I'll close with this. The last uh, week or so, week and a half, when Joe was in the hospital, I was trying to go by and say, you know, I took him, started taking him breakfast. And um, he says, well, I can't eat it. I said, what about grits? He goes, grits. Bring me grits and bring me scrambled eggs. So I found a little place not far from the hospital. I went by. I, brought, I think I might have brought the kids, son, too. And uh, you would have thought I'd brought him filet mignon. He was just powering that nest. So he says, man, when you come back tomorrow, bring four or five, you know, servings. And I'm like... <laughs> Which I did. And so this continues for a week. And before I know it, I'm coming up with this one. 
And I would walk to the hospital room in the morning and there would be doctors and nurses like lined outside this room like, <laughs> it looked like a, a cafeteria, right? <laughs> but that was Joe, he wanted everyone. He was, he, that's his way of giving and making people feel comfortable and wanted. And the nurses and doctors that came to visit him when they were not on duty, uh, it was amazing. I've, I've never, I've known a lot of people. I've never known anyone that could um, affect people like Joe, and sometimes just by one or two words. And he, Joe was easy. He was an easy person to love, and he's an easy person to know. And you always felt good when you were around Joe. Uh, you never knew what he was going to say, but you always felt good around him. And you know, people talk about legacies, and, and people measure legacies with, you know, a building or money or songs or whatever, whatever. I think that a person's legacy, the most important part of a legacy is how they treat people. And if that's true, then Joe's legacy is monstrously huge and will only live on, not only through the people he loved and influenced, but all this stuff behind us, because this is only going to get bigger and better as we go. It's not going anywhere. And uh, I will miss those late night calls, I'll have to tell you. Love you, Joe. Well, I'm not a public speaker, and I, I really, it's not something I like to do, but I just wanted to tell a, a quick story about Dad. Um, he had accomplished so much in his life, uh, but a year after I was born, he had a cut of a, a song called Old 8 by 10 and it was the, uh, the album cover. Uh, sadly, it never got released as a single. So for years, I can remember him saying, I really believe it could have been a monster hit had it been released as a single. But even after he had the guitar stores and started the museum, he always first and foremost said he was a songwriter. Well, after a few hours before his, his passing, he got a call from a great friend of ours, uh, Lee Bryce. And as I stood next to the bed and listened to them chat, just before they hung up, Dad said, so Lee, I'm gonna ask you a favor. Because <laughs> you can sing real country. I believe you should put out old eight by 10. <laughs> I think you could have a smash hit with it. So even in his last hours, he was still pitching songs. <laughs> so, if that ain't a true songwriter, I, I don't know what it is. So, although Lee couldn't be here with us today, um, he wanted to send something we could all enjoy. And uh, I know this would make Dad smile down on us all. So uh, here's a cover of Old 8 by 10 by Lee Bryce. Mr. Joe Chambers. Since the day I met you, you treated me like a, a son and a peer. And how you do that, I'm still not quite sure. But it was apparent that if uh, you ever wanted to do something or accomplish something, you didn't take no for an answer. You figured it out. Uh, you got it done. And most of the time I ever talked to you, those were the kind of values uh, that you wanted to impress on your children. Well, sir... I promise you succeeded in that. My friend, you made such an impact on Nashville. You are and always will be a legend in country music, and you will be missed immensely. Here's one for you. Well, I know it ain't much, but it's all that I had since she's gone. One black and white memory of the only love I've ever known. One moment in time when we were together, a page from the past. 
past to haunt me forever. A constant reminder that hearts heal much slower than bone. Now my whole world's in one eight by ten with four metal walls holding it in through one plate glass window blanket of dust stands an eight by ten picture of us I wish I Back when her sweet love was growing like wine I wish that she'd come back and love me again The way that she loved me in that old age by two Now the silence is deafening Day turns to dark Her presence gets stronger With each beat of my heart I pretend that she's here We've made a new start And for a moment She's back in my heart Now my whole world's in one eight by ten with four metal walls holding it in Through one plate glass window Blanket of dust Stands an eight by ten picture of us I wish I'd have told her What I felt inside Back when her sweet love Growing like wine I wish that she'd come back And love me again The way that she loved me In that old age by two Now the silence is deafening As the day turns to dark her presence gets stronger with each beat of my heart I pretend that she's here We've made a new start And for a moment she's back in my heart Now my whole world's in a one eight by ten With four metal The blanket of dust stands an eight by ten picture of us. It stands an eight by ten picture. In case you're wondering why I'm dressed like this. Do I resemble anybody that you all used to see, including the kids? So, I don't want anybody to think I was insulting the family, but I was paying tribute to, uh, to Joe. And my wife, Sonny, and I were talking, and she said, yeah, why don't he always had on that white shirt, blazer, kicks, jeans. I did tuck my shirt in in honor of the day. So, uh, uh, and I was kind of, uh, as I'm listening, I'm thinking, I don't know that I belong here in terms of worthiness. And then the description of what best friends mean. And you call your best friend when you need something. Well, I think I was that guy for Joe. Uh, I didn't get many of the sweet calls, but I got a ton of the... Butch, and I will say, he always said, I love you. Um, 
but that I knew the ask was going to get bigger. So, um, but I got a lot of those calls. Um, I spent the last 20 years of my career here in Nashville trying to really build, elevate, and showcase an authentic Music City brand. And all I really needed to do was meet Joe Chambers. He was an authentic Music City brand. I learned so much from, uh, from Joe and Linda. We first met as Joe and Linda opened the original Musicians Hall of Fame in Sobro. And I mention that because I'm kind of the guy that caused it to have to close. And having, you know, when you meet Joe and Linda, you're instantly like, you like them. Then you want to take care of them. And you want to be nice. And you want to hope that they like you back. So from the time I said, Joe, I'm sorry. We're going to have to do something different. But I promise we'll find a home. We're not letting the museum die. It won't go away. His passion for the musicians and the museum was undeniable. It was contagious. Uh, I'm not supposed to say in my day job what my favorite thing in the city is. It's this museum. I love coming over here. And no, we will not let it stop breathing. I was... So I'm going to put the we in quotes. We had to buy Joe out to make way for the Music City Center. Some of the toughest conversations I've ever had on both sides. Because I would go to, the, to Metro and go, you guys aren't screwing them over. We're going to make it right. We collaborated. We eventually made good on our promise. We were really involved, thanks to Mayor Dean, in finding this home for the museum and making it work. And then came opportunity to house a Grammy gallery. Nashville deserved a Grammy presence. There was only one place to really put it. It was right here and Joe was willing. Then I had this crazy idea the Rolling Stone exhibit was gonna to come to the US. We needed a place to put it. Joe, let's put it in here. Joe was always willing to help. He's also never afraid to call and ask for help or money, <laughs> or to bitch about government. You really haven't lived till you've heard Joe talk about those damn signs that he doesn't have, or that damn parking garage he can't use, or the damn management of Municipal Auditorium. <laughs> I heard it all. Hopefully I helped a little bit. Um, he's created a lasting legacy that this entire city should be thankful for and proud of. I'd like to close by saying next spring when we do our next ceremony, there will be a star for Linda and Joe Chambers in the Music City Walk of Fame. Thank you all. But you might want to get into show business. You're pretty good. Uh, Joe and I were meant to be friends, I think. I really believe that. Um, that's all right. You want me to have that? Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, because we were like-minded. Um, and that's what you're drawn to in life, people that are like-minded, that, that like the same things you do. Um, Joe and I both had the, the biggest reverence and respect and love for musicians, songwriters. And I was no different. I was, when I was a kid, I was not the kind of kid that had a hairbrush in the mirror pretending to be Elvis. I was a kid that had a guitar and I had my head down. I was trying to learn how to play the damn thing. <laughs> and uh, I bought records, not because of who the artist was. I bought so many records I'd never even heard of the artist. But I knew who the musicians were. I'd see a James Burton on the back of a record and I said, well, hell, it's got to be good if James is playing on it. And... And that's how I went through my life. And uh, it never changed. And uh, I'm, I must say, I'm not quite as, I don't have as much grace as Joe. I think I lost to the dance that year too. 
and uh, I'm still pissed. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. But uh, I got that tax from Joe, and I was out on the road and traveling and, and got back home, and finally, I didn't really understand the gravity of what was going on. And uh, I finally got, I called him, and uh, even in the conversation that we had, I really didn't comprehend that he was at the end of his life. And I really regret it. I think the conversation might have been different. But uh, in typical Joe fashion, it wasn't that much about him. You know, he just said, I'm not doing very good. The doctors don't, they're not saying very good things and all of that. And Linda told me that, uh, that uh, my phone call was the last one on his phone before he passed. So uh, I was grateful for that interview that we got to do down here. A lot of people saw it. The comments were about 50-50. I think they liked Joe a little bit more than they did me. <laughs> but just such grace in the conversations that you have with him because he wants, he's totally got the heart of a musician because he wants you to shine. That's what musicians do. They gather around and they serve the common good of a song. They all band together. And in my mind, the musicians are what created the best definition of the word democracy. Democracy is used, you know, in our world and you don't see very much of it with the powers that be. But with a group of musicians in a room to serve a song, that's where you see what the word really means. And uh, we'll dedicate this song to the family today and grateful for that friendship. I know 
will see him in that sacred place on that holy ground. Go rest high on that mountain. Cause some your work on earth is done. Go to Thank you. 